Hello and welcome everyone to our Consumer Healthcare Training Academy webinar. 2021 health and wellness will be different. We are so thrilled to have you join us today from different parts of the world. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you happen to be. Thank you so much for joining us. We are so glad you are here. Today, we are going to dive into the changes that are happening at the moment, then followed by the foresight of health and wellness journey, then the best practice examples and tools to help you win in health and wellness arena. We will have Q&A at the end of the session, so please send your question and comment to the chat box at the right corner of your screen. And if you are watching to Facebook Live, Please leave your questions in the comments below. Our team will gather questions for the speakers, and if your questions are not answered during the webinar, we will send an answer to your email by next week. At Consumer Healthcare Training Academy, when we do a seminar or a workshop, we always encourage our audience to always have these four questions in mind while listening. What excites you? What concerns you? Is there anything that concerns you while you are listening? What would you like to know more about? And what new ideas you come to? Uh, what new ideas come to you while you are listening? We are pleased to welcome the two very special guests, Deb McCocken. Deb is the founder of Bibliosexual and CEO of AI Agency with over 30 years of rich experience in marketing and advertising. He is a thought leader in marketing and advertising agency, a consumer insight and a consumer behavior expert, and an excellent storyteller, which I'm sure you will witness very soon. Our next speaker is Steve Salby, a founder of Exponential and a co-founder of Consumer Healthcare Training Academy. Steve is a marketing expert he has over 30 years of corporate and agency experience with the belief that people is the most important resource in building brand. He found it exponential. Um, he is also one of the most sought out facilitators in the consumer healthcare industry. Over to you, Dave and Steve. Oh, great. Um, Hi. Hello. How are Thank you there? there? I am there, sorry. Good day, yeah. how are you? Good day. I hit the wrong button. Um, <laughs> sorry, bad start. So we're all good to go. Uh, it's great to be here. Right. No, really looking forward to this because I, I think you're going to be sharing some really interesting new data on uh, some trends in uh, health and wellness. And that's really exciting for me because uh, this is really a global first on some of this data. So uh, really interesting. So I hope the audience really looks and tries to uh, uh, understand what does it mean for me, my company and my department, my brands. And then we're going to have a look at uh, some uh, thoughts about what might be a consumer journey uh, in the era post COVID. Yeah, I think that's uh, the important things is a lot of discussion, obviously, the last few months about what, what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? And now we're starting to see the discussion turning, well, what are we supposed to do going forward as, a, as opposed to immediate reaction? Uh, and so I think some of the data are, and the examples I'll show, some of the examples you're going to show will help people think about um, what they have to do next over the next six months, 12 months, et cetera, yeah. uh, as opposed to that immediate sort of panic that we went through, you know, it's yeah. February, March. Yeah. yeah. So what I want to uh, just underline, this is not a definitive uh, forecast of the future. Unfortunately, although uh, Dave and I have a lot of experience, we still don't have the expertise of predicting exactly the future. So hey, even if, though... If you and I could predict the future, would we be doing this webinar we, right now? We, we may not be sitting here anyway. We'd be on a yacht in Marbella, self-isolating in uh, absolute privilege. Um, exactly. So this is really for inspiration. This is really to try to spark some ideas and really get you to think about how you're going to start to develop a business and a brand 
which is future-proof, at least for the next couple of months or years. All right, Dave, do you want to uh, kick us off and uh, talk a little bit about some of the insights coming out of the new research? Yes, so if we can just switch over the, the control and I'll, I can control this now, I think. Yeah, oh, we've gone to the wrong thing. So bring it back up on full screen and I'll get started. So I wanted to uh, spend some time taking you through some of the things I've been learning as I've been working with some clients. Uh, I seem to have been sat endlessly in uh, webinars uh, the last uh, two, three months. I think actually this is the seventh webinar I've done in the last five days where I've been a participant in either the research industry, the wellness industry, et cetera, different aspects of learning about what people are doing and, and trying to put some of that together, hopefully to help some of you as you think through the future. So let me just go the other way. And first of all, the first thing you have to say is that obviously six months ago, we did not think that 2020 was going to be like this. We didn't think that this decade is going to be the way it will fall out. And basically, while we know that fundamentally a lot of things haven't changed what's happened and i'm going to point out is they perhaps sped up or taken new twists that we hadn't expected six months ago but we will definitely see from this point things that we have to take on board and change especially in terms of the way we're going to approach marketing product development and things like that so if you think about it though let me just point out that as bad as you might think the last three or four months have been, they're nowhere near as bad as we've been predicting. Uh, maybe you remember the last year, 2019, was the year in which Blade Runner was set. Um, and the world of Blade Runner was far darker than we lived in last year. I don't know how many of you ever watched the movie Soil and Green. I suggest you do look it up and have a look. It's a great Charlton Heston movie. It was made in the 70s. I think it was 1974. It was set in 2022, and basically it was about the fact that 99% of the world lived in superheated slums, and basically we were living off tablets that were made from human beings. So we were basically all cannibals, but didn't know it. We're not quite there yet. So let's not panic because it's never as bad as we've been predicting, but things have changed. The other thing we have to remember is that the one thing that we've learned from this last few months is, well, it might take longer than we thought. Uh, this is a, a relatively new piece of research that um, was uh, put out, I think, uh, late last week, but it was done the last week of April. It was done uh, in a bunch of countries around the world. And what you can see there is that over 50% of the world's population, or around 50%, predicts or expected expects that the, the COVID crisis in some way will last between six months and up to a year uh, and, and possibly longer. So what we see is most people expect this is going to carry on for a while. It may not be as dire as it has been in the last couple of months, but we're going to be very slow getting out of it. We're going to be very slow learning and we expect that there will be changes continually if we get used to, well, maybe not normal, but things that are changing. Yeah. yeah, and Dave, just to build on that, I think the economic fallout from uh, the COVID-19 is probably going to actually last a lot longer than a year. I think uh, uh, the very sort of immediate effects of COVID-19, yes, sure. it might be a year, but actually economies returning back to anywhere near, if ever, the levels that they had would take a lot longer. Yeah, one of the, one of the key things that we always take out, have to take out in the research while we're talking about longevity is the fact that the majority of the world financially uh, won't be able to afford to go back to the way things were for a long, long time. Um, and so when we're talking about, for example, health and wellness products, and before we started, Steve and I were just chatting about, you know, if you look at the wellness industry in particular, it's been very focused on the upper middle class around the world. Yeah. Well, the upper middle class has taken a huge hit. Um, and so industries like that have both got to remember that their, their usual long-term past consumers may not be able to afford what they used to do, but they also have to start thinking about what are they doing for the, the rest of the population and how you can start to help wellness grow to a more, uh, to the rest of the pyramid, if you like, you know, around the world. 
let me let me go to some of the changes that we've that we're seeing are happening. Um, hopefully, I haven't lost control of this at the moment. Yep, yes, there it is. Toilet. Yes, there Hooray. it is. Toilet. So those of you that know me uh, will know that I love giving public talks about toilets, but toilets are a fundamental thing that we have changed. If you think about it. Now, one of the things that we've noticed is that there's a lot of discussion in the last month in a lot of publications around the way in which public toilets or public facility toilets or toilets in workplaces will architecturally change. For example, a lot of discussion about the fact there will no be doors on toilets, uh, simply because we've always known that you can never trust the guy before you having washed his hands. Well, now it becomes a premium. Um, the idea of what we do inside the toilet, so no more taps on toilet on the wash taps. It'll all be sensors, uh, and some governments are thinking about mandating that in any public toilet. Um, but it just happened yesterday. I was listening to a, a presentation from the company Diversity and their management in Thailand, and they had some amazing statistics: 340% sales increase for commercial disinfectants and sanitizers. This is not products going to the public. This is for commercial purposes. And a lot of their business is in the hotel uh, retail type businesses. So even while a lot of those types of organizations were closed, there still was this massive increase in sales going on to them because they're having to prepare to change the ways they do things. A 1,200% increase in sales of disinfectant wipes to commercial organizations. Massive numbers. 10.8 million uh, uh, packages of alcoholic gels sold in three months, um, again, to commercial organizations. And so the way in which we think about toilets, uh, hotel rooms, restaurants, the way in which cleanliness works is fundamentally changed forever. And we're going to be thinking very hard about the architecture of places, the, the procedures, the way in which people work, and the expectations of us as we get back into the world and start visiting those places. Imagine yeah. your first trip back to a restaurant, to a night, Who's going to go to nightclub uh, toilets anymore, right? I mean, God help us. Um, yeah. My local pub toilet never was too good in the first place. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, Dave, again, building on that, uh, listening in on an HR conference uh, 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 a couple of days ago, the HR managers were saying their number one priority as people are going back to work is to ensure the safety and wellness of people in their companies. Yes. Um, so hence it plays very much into what diversity was basically talking about that uh, the workplace becomes an area for health and wellness and that is interesting because we didn't often think as marketers of how we would build our brands also in the workplace right and all different people I've heard talking about as they as their companies are thinking of opening up and opening our offices again simple things like Okay, I get the fact that the toilet might be cleaned regularly, but who's going to sanitize my desk every day? Um, mm. Who's going to sanitize the public spaces in the, in the office uh, on a regular, not every day, but every hour, for example. Uh, and so lots of things to think about. One of the key issues that, as we've gone into our month number three, four, five, depending where you live in terms of COVID, mm. is we've all learned habits and there's been tons of publicity campaigns you know, wash your hand campaigns, these ones are on display here from Bangladesh, but they're all over the world. Everywhere, look, people are learning to wash their hands more, sanitize more. But I go back to my own uh, history. I happen to live in Hong Kong during SARS. Now, in, during SARS, our company shut down for 10 days. We worked from home for 10 days. For about a month, every elevator in every high-rise building in Hong Kong that I visited had sanitizers going in, coming out alcohol wipes at, in all the public toilets, et cetera, et cetera. It just happened that the month before SARS hit, I was doing a major piece of research for a Colgate-owned company in Hong Kong and Southern China, looking at things like health and wellness. And we discovered what sort of were the normal levels in which people were washing their hands, how they were cleaning things, et cetera, whether it was good or bad. A month later, SARS hit, and for the next month, huge spikes in sales of sanitizers, disinfectants, etc. Three months after SARS, all the sales levels were back to pre-sales levels. So the question is, is that what's going to happen here? I suspect not. We all suspect not, because even SARS, a series it seemed at the time, 
was literally for most people in most of the world, a week, two weeks. Even in places like Hong Kong and Guangzhou, it was a month. And basically, most of it had sort of dissipated. This has gone on forever. And because we've been doing it for months, we learn and we experience and we think this is now going to continue. Yeah. And Dave, I think this really plays into the sort of the, 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 the change mindset of humans. It takes a long time to initiate practice, and practice, to establish practice. a change. So yeah. a week in Hong Kong during SARS was an inconvenience and people would have immediately bounced back. Uh, right. What we've done in most of the world is we've fundamentally changed the way of life that we had before COVID-19. Um, and I think there's going to be some longer lasting impact to that. Right. We, 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 we changed or returned. And a good example of return is better. Yeah, return is a good one. Yeah. So if you think about it, and if you're old enough, so, you know, I'll freely admit I'm in my 60s. And I'm old enough to remember, and I grew up on the very, very outskirts of Sydney in Australia. I'm old enough to remember the first TV being delivered to our house and my father and three of his friends trying to carry this TV that weighed a ton up the front steps into the hmm. house. But I do remember at that time as a young child that come, come late, late afternoon, evening, everybody sat on their front veranda because we all had houses with verandas in, in that neighbourhood and basically communicated to their neighbours across the street on the veranda on the house next door. And if you go back in Italy where my wife grew up, everybody sort of sat on the front steps or on the balcony and communicated in the evening with their neighbours. And then for 50 years, television took that away from us. And we went inside, inside and we communicated by just watching the same screens. And what's happened with around the world, of course, we've heard the famous examples of, you know, famous opera singers getting on the balcony and all that sort of stuff. But what we've actually seen is more and more people actually talking to their neighbours at a distance. Yeah. But that community interaction, the discovery of the need for human contact, uh, the, the, the need for locally thinking, what's available around me, how do I get on around with the people around me, has become much more important. And again, I think that's a relearning that people will take to heart. Yeah. A friend of mine in Sri Lanka uh, developed this chart the other day. Thank you, Professor Ath. But um, it really brings home one of the other big learnings, which is that most of the things that have changed in the last few months are actually about just speeding up things that we knew about and were happening anyway. Um, what's happened is the COVID pandemic, the crisis, like a lot of big breaks, makes you actually change things faster or speed up things faster or forget things. And as examples, for example, if you think about it, um, sometimes this is slow, just moving between charts. Uh, try again. There we go. Yeah, getting there. The thing about water, uh, Steve knows, some of you that are listening in know that I have been very big on talking about water stress for the last few years and the water crisis that's going on in the world. I saw this great diagram from Bangladesh uh, a couple of weeks ago, which highlighted one of the biggest issues about the COVID crisis. We're all being told to more thoroughly wash our hands. We forget that on average, if we do wash our hands properly, the right number of times a day, we add to our household consumption per person 15 to 20 litres of water per day for everybody. Now, the problem with that is we already, all those red countries are countries that have massive water shortages now. We've already got to a point now where in the last two years, 47 major cities around the world face the point of not having no water, not having enough water for continual existence. That's going to grow. The important thing to this for marketers, though, is to think that this crisis will bring into context water shortages, the need for water, how you're using water. And for brands, how are you preparing for that? How are you preparing to manufacture, deliver, etc., using less water? How are you going to be talking about water usage? That's a, a very important wellness subject that will continue to grow exponentially. The crisis is bringing it more and more into focus. Yeah, Dave, just, uh, just on that, what do you think about, uh, do you think uh, the, the, the issue around sustainability, do you think that COVID uh, situation will have accelerated 
our uh, attention towards sustainability, towards the planet. I mean, uh, here in Bangkok, we've been enjoying uh, smog-free days for the last two months, right. and it's been absolutely I think, amazing. I think There's mountains must... on the horizon that right, I didn't right. even know up here. Uh, right. Will we actually carry on and accelerate our sustainability um, attitude uh, because of COVID? I, a number of things. Obviously, millions and millions of people around the world are seeing skylines and mountains in the distance they've never seen before, right? So sm smog levels in major cities have, you know, really gone down. Uh, fantastic. Um, that same young generation of people, not, not old guys like you and me, Steve, but, you know, people like our, our children who are in their 20s, quite often in the cities they live in, they've never seen the, the horizon like they have now. That's also a generation that's been more mindful about things like sustainability, the, uh, uh, you know, what's happening with the environment, etc. cetera. Um, again, speeding up. What was happening for the last two years, the, the Greta Thunberg revolution, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. will speed up, okay? Because people now are sitting there going, oh, wait a minute, if I don't drive to work, if we all don't drive to work, the advantage is we get to breathe cleaner air. It's, it's evident to yeah. people now because they're actually living it for you know three or four months. So again, yeah. the reconsideration of those things. But yeah. of course we've seen some flip backs. So for example, the use of plastic bags, plastic straws, et cetera, yeah. in most cities has gone up. Why? Because we're ordering more home delivered food. So we've yeah. got to resolve some of those issues, but on the bigger perspective, I think what you're gonna see is sustainability as we start to come out of the immediate crisis. And we're already seeing that, remember, because we're already seeing in the last two weeks, more and more conferences, webinars being announced about reintroducing sustainability and then the links to post-COVID world. And that's yeah. gonna become more and more in the front. What, and of course, what's happening is, is people are already prone to deliver pandemics one okay. way or the other, right? So that will continue. Another thing that's sped up, of course, is things like the use of our phone for things like pay, uh, pay, uh, no touch systems, et cetera. Uh, the way you pay for use phones is changing or rather speeding up because what we're starting to see with that is things like um whoops go back uh apps so many many people over the last 10 years have downloaded uh exercise apps so the apps that measure how far how many steps you've taken every day but we know that they have downloaded them then barely used them. But what we've seen in the last four months is the usage levels of these apps has gone through the roof. So more and more people are now using these apps as part of a, hey, they've got more, a bit more time because they're at home or whatever, but they're consciously trying to track their food, their exercise, etc. We've also seen more apps being given to us about the way to solve the pandemic problem. Now that sometimes causes controversy. Uh, the contact tracing app, first developed in Singapore, but now being you know, used or introduced in other countries, is creating a lot of issues. In some countries, like in India, Singapore, maybe a Japan, Korea, people are more willing to accept it. It's a universal thing, okay, or maybe the government mandates it. In mm. some Western countries, like Australia, or my own country, or the USA, hell no, we're not gonna allow that one in. Uh, that's, that's just the government trying to track us down. So it will be controversial in some places, but it's an indication of things that we knew were happening but being sped up by the crisis. The idea of having tracing apps is not a new idea, that the pandemic gives governments the reason for introducing it, saying, look, this is with public health factors. And then, of course, it'll be hopefully used for other public health factors as well. But what we're also seeing in terms of the way in which apps apply is home delivery. Now, home delivery, of course, if you live in Bangkok, we think of things like Grab or food panda or something like that. So it's mostly about eating. But the reality of it is that home delivery is now expected. It's a you, come to you economy. Anybody selling anything to anybody else is now expected to have some mechanism to have it delivered to my front door. Um, and so whether that's a wellness product, uh, a wellness service, uh, for health products of any nature, that will be expected to be available and easily they come to me now. Yeah. That's, a, that's been happening, but sped up dramatically. Yeah. 
And uh, Dave, we know, for example, that uh, that uh, pharmacy or wellness or medical also is uh, is part of that trend. Uh, we've seen uh, in recent data that the increase in online or e-commerce uh, purchases of uh, uh, consumer healthcare products. Uh, most pharmacies, most chain pharmacies will offer an online uh, delivery or a, uh, a click and collect. Um, yes. And uh, even Grab is starting to get in on that. Uh, so they're testing out a concept for Grab Health which uh, effectively would be an online pharmacy service where people yes. can have their uh, can have their medicines uh, together with their pizza when it's delivered. All right, so they're really looking at the same timelines, 30 minutes from you ordering to it being delivered. And right. that's the way that we're going to have to start to think in health and wellness as well. Exactly, exactly. And that will then be amplified again because this is the year that 5G is going to be start to roll out. Not in every country, but in some countries, 5G is scheduled to get started very soon. And what does 5G really mean? Well, the mo for, for normal people, the real meaning of 5G is that apps will now move very quickly into a whole new level of uh, service. They'll move, move into AR. Uh, AR will be much more possible. So whatever you're doing with your app now, you'll be able to do it in 3D. Uh, whatever you're doing with your app now, there'll be made more AR applications that will allow you to enjoy the application more, get more context, uh, build it into more gamification, etc. And so quite simply, the, the need for these things on our phones, driven by the crisis, and the new technology that will come available through the use of 5G, means that we're going to see a massive speeding up on what you can do on these things. Yeah, yeah. The, one of the other things that's sped up dramatically is, as long as I've been in the workplace, we have debated things like work from home. We have debated, as a manager of you know, large offices with lots of people, do we have work from home? Do we have cubicles? Do we have open space offices? What we've basically seen in the last four months is that, wait a minute, work from home is, can probably work for an awful lot of people. Not everyone, I'll come back to that, but for a lot of people. But it has its ups and downs. Some people are happier working from home, some are a bit frustrated. But the truth is that we're seeing reports from different studies about simple things like, yeah, I don't really want to go back to the office, but if I could have the coffee breaks yes. in the office. I don't mean virtual coffee breaks, but a real coffee break. Or more importantly, I just saw a study from Japan which said that Japanese office workers are missing the chance to go downstairs and have a smoke with their friends. Um, now, that's not a good wellness issue, I know, but it's indicative of the fact we sometimes, working from home, the thing we miss is the, is the real human touch. Uh, and so yeah. we've got to work that. The other big thing, of course, is the work from home is drawing a huge amount of debate because for some people, it's great, but for a lot of people, it's debate, am I actually working more now? Mm. Uh, the hours seem unlimited. Remember the first few weeks of working from home around the world, everybody was saying, well, it's great because I'm saving the two or three hours I used to commute yeah. and I get to do other stuff. But actually what happens is, well, now I'm doing more Zoom calls earlier and later, you know? So um, it's, a, it's a mixed bag, but all of that goes back to uh, employers uh, with working from home, have to start thinking more and more about the mental and physical wellness issues that come up from working from home and how can they be helping their employees? Uh, are they delivering, uh, employers, part of their packages, they're delivering home wellness platforms that can help their employees stay healthy, stay physically and mentally healthy while sitting on their couch doing whatever yeah. they're doing, right? Yeah. No, there is, uh, just to build on that, Dave, there is a huge, I didn't even realize the extent of the uh, human resource technology or people technology that's available and including gaming uh, uh, apps that people can be using at home, including uh, obviously social, elements obviously the uh, the virtual meetings that we're all uh, engaged in um, but there is an absolute wealth of technologies that can help to facilitate work from home and yes. uh, and a lot of it is focused around that uh, mental wellness um, yeah. and this is something that in the past was not so much a priority for many businesses it was more about the physical wellness or physical security. But now work from home 
has initiated so much more development and innovation in terms of ensuring mental well-being. Yes. Um, and that's very interesting. Very interesting. And that comes alive in this chart. So let me just explain. Significant Systems is an AI-driven platform that I use for market research. The way it works is you plug in a term or whatever subject you want to explore. You tell it which country and which language you want to explore. And then it literally reads every piece of content on the internet in that language around that subject. So I asked in English globally to look at work-life balance. And a couple of days ago, uh, this is what it pushed out. Now, what it's actually telling me is it looked at literally over a billion pieces of content, read all of that content, and then analyzed it and summarized that these are the emotions being generated around the subject of work-life balance. Now you can see the green ones are positive emotions, the red ones are negative emotions, and the bluish ones, bluish purple, are emotional cues that are uh, uh, top of mind. Now what you can see there is it's a mixed bag. There's a lot of strong green, joy, happiness, but there's also fear and anxiety uh, that is driven by work-life work balance and the way in which work from home is changing that. Uh, anybody interested, I can show you the deeper report. The important thing there is there's also a lot of expectation. So yeah. very, deep, very deep expectation that this is gonna to lead to a big difference. Uh, and what this tool helps me do is analyze what the narrative is around that subject. And if what it's really identifying here is that, yeah, fully engaged lifestyles are going to be a mix of this work-life balance, but in a real way that we perhaps have not been thinking about. We have to come yeah. out, overcome those fears and anxieties uh, about, and also accentuate what's the joy and the happiness. That comes yeah, out. yeah. Uh, let me just introduce a new uh, term for that now, Dave. I now know from my experience in the HR community, it's called the work-life boundaries. So they're not talking about work-life balance anymore. They're talking about work-life boundaries. So right. how do I ensure that when I'm at home, I do develop and keep to boundaries between my yes. work and my home? Hours, um, space, etc. Exactly. Et Hours, space, so, even so what, stress. That, that's, um, that's some, right. And what yeah, you're some HR. Is, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say. Well, what we're seeing is there's an awful lot of reporting, a lot of information now, where different organisations are actually putting out advisories on, you know, how to help people work from home, what it, what you should be doing. Uh, there's a lady, Dr. Ice, here in Bangkok, who's done a, a great series of videos and and Facebook feeds around how to be more productive from work from home environments. Yeah. Uh, and we need to see more brands getting involved in that advisory and then supplying the products and services to make that real. Uh, one of the other things about working from home is we're all doing this more often, right? We're all doing a lot of Zooming. And I guess a lot of you have seen pictures like this, uh, Justin Trudeau or Famous Stars, etc. You may have been tracking that just like me, an awful lot of people are doing a lot of messaging with a bookshelf in the background. And why are we doing a bookshelf in the background? Well, this started off in the first month or so that people started to notice this. The big game was to try and zero in and find out what Justin was reading or what Dave is reading. Write to me if you want to know what I read. But, <laughs> but what's interesting is, is the reporting that's come up in the last few weeks, which is all about the fact that this is credibility, right? Your background when you're Zooming is just like when you walk into somebody's office and you look around at the furniture, the architecture, the way it's laid out, you make an assumption about that office to that, how professional it is, how modern it is, et cetera, by the way the office looks. So basically, this is what backgrounds matter. The way, look, I was wearing a T-shirt today doing some phone calls to some people, but as soon as I knew I was on a Zoom call with Steve, I put on a real shirt. Why do I do Absolutely. that? Absolutely, I did the same. Right. <laughs> Because no one wants to look at this old geezer in a t-shirt, right? So, <laughs> Speak for yourself, Dave. So, but, but what that means is there's then a lot of pressure for work from home about professionalism. What does that mean? Yeah. Right? What does that actually mean now in a new context? And that, again, adds to the strain, the mental strain. One of the other things that we've seen shifting is a shift in home cooking. Now, obviously, we've been forced maybe to do more home cooking. But let me give you a simple example of the shifts. I'm sure most of you watching either have watched or know of the MasterChef uh, shows around the world. What's interesting is that we know from years of experience that MasterChef and all those celebrity cooking shows, people watch for entertainment, not to learn to cook. 
actually what we found is, and research has shown that in countries where shows like MasterChef are very popular, home cooking was actually going downhill, not increasing. People love to watch it, they just didn't want to do it. But what's happened through the COVID pandemic is we are now fascinated by learning to cook again, partly because it gives us something to do, partly because we're focused on nutrition and health and wellness. So exactly. fresh homemade food makes a difference. That's led, for example, to a whole rise of new celebrities. So I'm sure in terms of exercise and wellness, many of you will have seen John Wick. My wife is a big fan. She does John Wick sessions every morning, right? Um, Nat's What I Reckon is a great series from Australia. It's very crude and very rude. He's an Australian comedian who does cooking lessons on how to make fresh food. It's vulgar, but it's hugely popular uh, around the world. Uh, non, non and Arena is another Australian series where it's an Italian grandmother basically uh, talking about how to make genuine pasta. Lots of these things are clicking in, and that's all because of an overwhelming need for us to figure out while we've got the time at home, how do we stay healthier, more wellness? What's the simplest ways we can do it? Those sorts of trends. You now, for example, you've got a whole generation of people, young people, in especially the middle class world, who home exercise and home cooking. Well, they weren't doing that six months ago. Yeah. And yeah. now they are. So, and they've been doing it for weeks and weeks and weeks. And lots of people, when schools are starting to open up, we're constantly hearing about complaints about, yeah, but when do I do, get to do my cooking class today? When do I do, get to do the Joe Wick class today if I've got to go to school, right? Because they've been three or four months of, hey, I've got used to this. It changes your lifestyle. Let me move on. Just finished, recently, uh, I've been involved in the release of a new study uh, using that significant systems platform of, of understanding what the whole of the internet is saying about different subjects. We put in 150 different narratives relating to health and wellness. And what we did was we asked the machine to explore them, read all the content in English around the world, around those narratives, and then rank them in terms of importance. The top 10 narratives that perform the best are those in front of you. They range from maybe the obvious food quality, but think about how important that is in a COVID environment, uh, yeah. healthy skin, through to will, wellness building design and the way in which we go back to my toilet story, but think about the way we're going to, this has concentrated us worried about do our apartments feel good? Will our offices be the right space for wellness? We're also seeing uh, interest in wellness tourism. You know, we want to, people want to go back to exploring places, maybe domestically rather than foreign. But, you know, and then some brands. And for example, it just happened, we explored about a, a dozen brands and the way in which they're, they're connected to wellness. It just happened that Suntory did better than the others in terms of being seen as a transformative brand for the future of wellness. Um, if you want to know more about the details of the study, I'll be glad to share them. But let me take you through a couple of the top line things. Yeah. The platform measures all the narratives we put into it and lays it out on this grid. If it's in the top right hand corner, that's what we call transformational, which was basically means it's the narratives that are going to are transforming and will continue to transform the bigger subject of wellness in the future. When we break it down into looking at nutrition and wellness issues, two stand out. Food quality and nutrition, not surprising, but also gut health. Gut health is the most important transformational issue in terms of nutrition and wellness, according to this research. And that's simply because people are really concerned about what's going inside of them and how their body is reacting. And if anything, the COVID crisis has now magnified that interest. Yeah. Dave, it's interesting that immune health or the, the health of your immune system or general uh, immunity uh, didn't come up given COVID is effectively attacking our immune systems in such a vicious way. Um, yeah. And yet, we also see a significant rise in uh, the sales of vitamins, minerals, and supplements, specifically around vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E, who have got uh, health benefits in terms of the immune system. How do you, how do you balance this out? Okay, so two, things. Things. two things. One is the gut health narrative, actually, when we explore that, covers off partly what you're talking about immunity systems. Gut health is connected with, a lot of the time, it's in people's perceptions, connected with immunity. 
uh, you'll notice in the bottom right left corner, which are what we call transit or those narratives that are didn't form very well, is food supplements. Right now, mm -hmm. part of that is because uh, as the platform was looking at the issue, um, it was finding that the, the conversation, the content around food food supplements, uh, hadn't really changed with the times. It's basically people might be aware of the need for supplements because of the crisis, but actually what's being produced. And remember, this is reading the content that's out there. And what it's finding is that the conversations about and the, the articles around food supplements are really a little bit old fashioned. It's really yeah. not changing. And there hasn't been a lot of change because if you think about it, the supplement world for one reason or another, hasn't really, the dynamics haven't changed much mm. in the last 10 years, right? Um, mm. The way in which we present it, the way in which we package it. You and I have discussed a lot uh, about the way it's presented, for example, in pharmacies, et cetera, or, <coughs> you know, it basically hasn't changed in a decade or more, right? Uh, the packaging, yeah. but if you think about then the content around it hasn't changed that a lot either. Now that might be starting to change because of COVID, but it wasn't reflected in this research. Yeah. It does indicate that people with food supplements need to think a bit harder about how they make their messaging much more relevant to today's needs. Yeah. Uh, one thing that just to, to build on that, and again, linked to, to this particular slide in terms of uh, diet, uh, could be that food supplements, uh, the food supplements rise that we've been seeing might have been uh, people who were already taking them, but perhaps not taking them every day. Uh, yep. all of a sudden starting to buy more to take it every day rather than having new people coming into pharmacy right. or grocery and buying right. supplements. Hey, I'm a little I wish I, that, that, that's going to be I'm something like, interesting to, to look true. at. In talking, my own family uh, here in Bangkok and in Australia, uh, my friends and their families, I've picked that up, that most of us were casual. We, we always had that jar of multivitamins. Yeah. But... You know, you take for the first week you take it religiously. The second week it was every second day, and then the second half of the jar got left there for months. Uh, okay. And what's changed, perhaps, is that oh no, I've got to be more dedicated about that. You know, more ritualized. Uh, and part of the discussion about those sorts of things is the re-ritualization. You know, if you think about food cooking, the re-ritualization is based on well seclusion, and we've been forced to rethink about cooking. But it creates this ritual of uh, the. the the different videos we're going to watch, the different things we're going to watch, the tips we're yeah. going to get. One of the other interesting things is, is you know, as the re-interest in diet has changed, is things like Weight Watchers is, done, is reportedly doing very well. Not because of the normal things we associate, like going to meetings and the exercise, but shit, because they've twisted out, oh, here's, here's a healthier diet that's easy to access. Companies that are doing that thing about, here's a healthier diet that's easy to access, uh, have picked up in the last few months because people want healthier food delivered at home, right? Yeah. Um, quickly moving on, gut health, as I said, very important tra uh, transformational narrative uh, going forward. You can see here, when we look at the emotions generated around all the content around gut health across the internet, it's mostly positive, green, uh, positive type attributes, a lot of expectation, again, not much negativity, because people basically are trying they're enthusiastic. Uh, the content is enthusiastic. The content is saying good things about gut health can be related to a whole bunch of other things in life. It's the basis of core health and wellness, etc. And so people are reacting to that in a positive way. An interesting side one. I just want to raise this. First reaction to thermal springs, you go, oh, no, I'm not going to go sit in you know, thermal springs when the COVID is on. Actually, I've been involved in some discussions with the Global Wellness Institute. And what's really interesting is all the science says that the safest place, the safest place you can go in the COVID crisis is to go sit in thermal springs because it naturally kills the virus um, and the surroundings of it. Now, what's happening is as thermal spring operators are starting to open up, they've got to put in new protocols about what you do in changing rooms, et cetera. But what the, the strength of this is the fact that it's a natural cleansing process. And we expect, and this is why it was reported as transformational, because we think what's going to happen is people are going to start for natural wellness solutions and lifestyle habits. And more and so, pure, more cleansing, yeah. Right, right, right. Uh, people will remember the brands that have helped them. Seems pretty uh, obvious, but of course, we've seen a lot of brands not react in the right way. They've been all about sympathy, but not action. 
Hmm. But what we have found is a very recent piece of Google research done across the many markets found that one in three people say that they've recently started using a new brand because of the innovative and compassionate way it's responded to the pandemic. So they may not remember the details of the product. It's more about, hey, you sound like you're trying to make a difference. You're trying to help me. And again, 31 to 55% of consumers across the world say that brands can be most helpful at this time by setting realistic expectations. Don't overclaim to help us find a realistic way in which we can solve our problem and people will believe in you and switch. Yeah. One last point I want to finish up with. The trends aren't even. Uh, these are photos from Bangladesh, but it could be any developing country. Um, when we think about social isolation, we can look at that top left-hand corner and think, oh, yeah, that's sort of funny, sort of, you know, the way in which people are going to deal with that or whatever. Uh, the the, the right-hand picture is somebody working from home in a typical village. What is she doing? Well, she's sorting out the rice for dinner. Nothing has changed. I was on a call, a webinar, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, two weeks ago, um, with a bunch of senior uh, marketers in Bangladesh. And what was really interesting, this particular guy, uh, Sean is the head creative director for the most famous advertising agency in Bangladesh. And very early on in the call, he said, look, all this discussion about working from home, it's a great, it's a global thing now. We'll get that. Self distancing, it's a mantra. Everybody gets it. It's gonna be hard to break for Western elitist middle class. For the rest of the world, it's totally unrealistic. And we can see on the left-hand side that yes, in most developed countries and you know, bigger economies, yeah, all this stuff is fairly easy. A bit more difficult in Korea and Japan because the big companies weren't set up for, self, for home. Uh, they didn't have the IT. But the reality we have to remember is for the great bulk of the world, the things that we take for granted, like being on this Zoom call and working from home are literally impossible. And so the big challenge for the health and wellness industry and the big opportunity is not only maybe to service people like Steve and I a little bit better with home delivered goods, et cetera, et cetera, helping us work from home better, but it's to think about the two thirds of the world's population that literally can't do this, that literally need a different type of health and wellness solutions. Yeah. And so my last thought is this, pretty soon, this is gonna be normal in the third world. People will quickly go back to the crowded situations they've always been in. And what we have to think about, whether it's there, or sitting in my nice apartment in Bangkok, or all of you around the world that are listening to this is, brands have to think about what matters to people. And what matters to them will be, how, how do I maintain health? How do I maintain wellness in this vastly changed environment? Yeah. And I think uh, that is one of the concerns that I really had when uh, we started this conversation, uh, Dave. It's very much how do we ensure that health and wellness does not just become a privilege of the elite or of the rich or of the uh, opportunity uh, to people who are living in more developed markets or, or more developed levels of society. So as, a, as an industry, as a group of industries that are investing in health and wellness, how do we ensure that we're able to influence the health and wellness, not only of a very small proportion of the population, but the majority of the population? Well, um, we're, uh, we've got about 12 minutes to go, and what I wanted to do is just um, get you thinking a little bit about what might be a new uh, health and wellness journey in the future. And uh, we'll see if that works, and it does. There's a mantra that I've been talking about. Dave talks a lot about toilets. I talk about medicine a lot. And that is that uh, the best medicine, in my view, has always been the person, whether you want to call them the patient, the consumer, the shopper, whatever is the title, but at the end of it, there is an individual uh, who is informed, empowered, and inspired. Informed through the right kind of information, empowered with tools, which might be different solutions, there might be tips and techniques, but most importantly, inspired. And for me, this COVID situation has been very much an example that 
actually the future in health and wellness is not in the pharmacy, it's not in the hospital, it's not in the clinic, it's not in the grocery, it's not even in the home, it's in the person. And that is a different way that I'd like us to start thinking about the way that we deliver the solutions. Um, so let's start thinking about the person, uh, not the place. Um, because I think for all of us, and uh, uh, me and my family and friends, we've experienced the same. We've realized that we cannot trust responsibility to, for our health to our government, our doctors, our nurses, uh, because literally COVID has almost broken our health systems. And government's reaction has been, go home, isolate. And it's all very much about the individual and in this change we've been uh, informed through the constant wave of news direction almost a, a tsunami of uh, of bad news and it's interesting the human psychology reacts better to avoiding risk than it does to opportunities so when there's risk then people tend to react and that's what we did and we've been inspired to change so basically what I would like to think about is really a journey which has the person in the middle. In this particular case, we've given her a name. It's Anne, but it could be any one of us, and it probably will increasingly be men of a certain age and a certain lifestyle. Uh, not exactly like Dave and myself, but really it will be very much down to the individual. So very quickly, because we don't have a lot of time, the, the, the core of the personal journey of health and wellness is the individual. And I think we need to work a lot harder, even though we have played lip service to deeply understanding our consumers and our individuals, we tend to go back to describing them in typical demographic age groups, income levels, uh, wherever they might be living. But basically, this is an individual who is now really empowered and inspired and is incredibly powerful. Um, and we know from certain research that in many of the major markets, the experience and inspiration for self-care has actually been very high on their priorities. And we're seeing also in the work that you've just demonstrated, the importance of the individual. So they are rediscovering the journeys, they're making decisions, and they're actually challenging experts. The home is really also an important location. It's the first and most important, if you like, location for health and, and wellness. And this is something that we've been experiencing in the last few months. Um, it is the location in many cases for prevention. So hence what you're talking about in terms of nutrition, in terms of uh, the way, in terms of mental health, in terms of the way we work and the work and life uh, divide, um, the way that we've been leveraging technology for information and inspiration, the way that we're actually asking for convenience at home, and the importance of, as we said, uh, nutrition. Um, what we've not often thought about as a location for every year of health and wellness is our grocery. So when we buy food, it's not been so much for the health benefits of the food we buy, it's been in many cases, the convenience. And now we're gonna be seeing increasing in terms of healthy food. It's going to be a prime location for good food, but also for supplements and this is not just physical locations, of course. I think increasingly uh, e-commerce will dominate our grocery businesses. The workplace, as we've mentioned before, now becomes a transformed location for health and wellness. And here, as I said, many companies will take the responsibility for well-being and safety very seriously. And this will start to transform also the openness of people to start thinking about health and wellness in the workplace. Pharmacy is, of course, my uh, favorite location, but I think through COVID-19, uh, pharmacy is also transforming. 
Uh, of course, it's a convenient location for that first face-to-face -face health and wellness advice, but the amount of e-commerce from pharmacy has actually increased exponentially. And this, if we add this together with virtual consultations and e-commerce, we can start to see a completely new model of pharmacy starting to develop in the next few years. And if we go to India, many of these models are already there. So we can start to learn very much from what's happening in those locations. And then the clinic, the general practice in some markets, the community clinics, this is of course the first and center for general medical guidance and advice. It's more convenient than hospitals for many people. And it, we are seeing again here, um, as you demonstrated in, in yours, virtual consultations for uh, some people. And then finally, the hospital, which of course is the center for, for urgent and serious and acute care, but this is now also transforming into centers of wellness almost completing that circle uh, of health and wellness. So what I would like us to do as an industry is not think about our traditional business model of one particular customer or location, but really think about this as a holistic ecosystem, which is centered around the individual, but requiring us as solution providers to give a smooth and seamless integration and this is where our brands can play a role. But this is also where collaboration pays a role. Because through this openness, through a more holistic system, collaboration internally, first of all, with different departments in our organization to ensure that we understand the role of our brand, our products in the journey, is really important. And I start to question sometimes also some of the big integrations or deintegrations of some of the companies as they've separated their consumer business from their hospital or doctor business, whether that might be the best idea for the future. But even if they stay separated, the collaboration between those units and collaboration across different companies is also very important. So importantly, we have to create these win-win-win opportunities. And I'm not going to go through the examples because some of these we know already. We know, of course, that uh, Sanofi and GSK have broken boundaries across companies to collaborate. We know here in Thailand that technology companies like uh, True are going together with hospital groups and with insurance companies to create a seamless ecosystem where people can get information, advice, diagnosis, and product through one seamless ecosystem. And finally, with Google and Apple uh, collaborating in the technology area when it comes to contact tracing on COVID. And one which uh, goes together with what I was saying with Grab, if Grab is starting to collaborate with Heineken in terms of delivering my beer, it's not a big leap of imagination to know that they're going to be delivering my Nurofen or my paracetamol or my uh, aspirin or my cough and cold medicine to my bed almost uh, in 30 minutes of me waking up and finding that I've got a sniffle. So it's something really important that we need to think about. Okay, it's just getting to that hour. And what I wanted to do is uh, perhaps open it up a little bit for a little bit of discussion um, to start to think about what we might want to be knowing more about. So I think we've got time for maybe one or two questions, Dave, if that's all right with you. I can sit on this all night if you want. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all okay. right. Uh, Aim, please. Yeah, what, we... uh, what sort of questions? Yeah, we got some questions from our participants here. Um, one question, as work and home boundaries merge, is the work-life balance the right metric or should we be looking more at achievement versus enjoyment? Mm. Yeah, mm. that's an interesting one. I actually saw that question on the feed when it came up. 
Uh, it's a really good thing. I think what's going to happen is that work-life balance has been in the past uh, been a functional thing uh, where it was measured in terms of uh, things you actually did. Yeah. And I think it's correct that what we're already seeing, and, it, and again, it's about speeding up because the work-life balance discussion, and I should mention that, that significant systems thing that I showed you, actually is a daily feed that's been going on for about two years where there's a report every single day on what's been how work life balance is measured around the world at least in the english language into that world and what we've seen is progressively more interest in output rather than the functionalities of getting stuff done yeah uh, and know. so i think that's a very good point and one of the things that if i was a company, especially a major company, uh, I would be looking to try to put in place uh, uh, measurements and, uh, uh, that, of that, right? Um, and uh, correlating that to things like health, exercise, diet, uh, those sorts of things as well. Because I think what we're going to see is we assume, we've always assumed that if people are working from home, they're going to be mentally and physically better off. Mm -hmm. We've always made that assumption. Um, and that's always been the proponent for the discussion about work-life balance, right? Which was, well, work is hard, life is better. Um, but now we need actual people to actually start measuring that and see if yeah. that's... Because the early stages, the, the, the three, four, five-month ex, you know, examples, uh, some of my wife's cousins in, uh, in Italy, uh, for example, uh, family back in Australia, friends in Japan, who are being stressed out by working from home um, and are thinking that their output is actually declining um, because they're distracted too easily, because they don't have somebody there literally looking over their shoulder. Mm. Uh, so, you know, one of, the, one of the things that maybe we need to start measuring is self-discipline and the way in which self-discipline changes outputs, et cetera. So, but yes, we do need to change the measurement yeah. method. Yeah. Aim, give us yeah. another question then. Um, so what does we, what do we see as the key operational challenges in bringing better health to all? Is the supply chain due for reform? <laughs> Very interesting. If I uh, take a stab at that uh, first, Dave, uh, I think I think if we buy into a holistic ecosystem of health and wellness. I think it really calls into question the entire model that we've been operating in our businesses for the last, say, 50 years, which effectively has not changed. And what we're seeing now is that the opportunities for innovation and consequently supply can be vastly improved and sped up if you start thinking very differently in terms of uh, you know, in many business, it was, oh, not invented here. We don't want to do anything with other people outside of our organization. Whereas now the future, I think, is going to be collaborations uh, of different companies working together, each of which have expertise in a particular part, but then work seamlessly together. Um, and I would venture in many organizations that actually working with partners is sometimes easier than working with internal departments. So I think that we will see some major transformations. And for example, I've seen this happen in Korea where the new entrepreneurs are being encouraged to think more on how do I grow my business through collaboration rather than trying to do everything myself. And I've seen a skincare company go from nothing to being a leading skincare provider within two years. And that is astronomical in terms of uh, the speed by which they did that. So, um, yeah, I think you have to look at every part of your business in terms of the transformation that's facing us. Dave? Oh, I agree. I think, I think the example you said about you know, hospitals, insurance companies, different types of health product providers uh, crossing over in, in services like we've seen with Sanity Bay here, and et cetera. Uh, but those sorts of crossovers, uh, one of the interesting things is if you think about the number of patents that companies have that they're not using, 
And the reason mm. that quite often they're not using it is because, well, we developed it, but we couldn't figure out what to do with it. Well, we, we couldn't find the right niche at the right time, or we didn't think it was economically viable at the time. And I have a good friend in Japan, for example, who's been advocating and trying for years to get 10 large corporations in totally different industries to pool all their patents and basically say, we're gonna, you know, if between us we have a million patents, everybody can have access to them all. If you can figure out how to use our patent, great. And then you just pay us a piece of what you, you've done it for. Um, but I think those sorts of collaborations is one of the things that we'll need to, the system in terms of delivery systems, supply systems, all those sorts of things, but we need to think about collaboration in new sorts of ways. Maybe Fantastic. Fantastic. All right, let's have one more. Uh, we are five minutes over, but if uh, if our participants are willing to sit and listen to one more question, I've, Dave and I can sit here, as he said, for the rest of the evening, but let's okay. have, just have one more question. <laughs> okay, the last question of today, but don't worry, um, the rest of the question we will answer, uh, yes. the speakers will answer and then send it to all of you by email by next week. So the last question of the day is, will food stores increase their profiling of wellness and OTCs because of their increased top of mind rather than a Cinderella's area in the store? Yeah. yeah. Um, Dave, do you wanna uh, start? And I'll, uh, I'll put in my two penny worth. Freshness has been freshness and uh, you know, source of origin, uh, local grown food, organic food, have struggled. They've been, everybody around the world in the business has been in the food business has expected that to explode more than it has for literally decades. Of course, we've seen in recent years, the big supermarket chains around the world, et cetera, Amazon, et cetera, try to rethink fresh food delivery, a lot of the problem is supply chain, right? A lot of it is ensuring that it really is fresh, that the sourcing is good, that it is what it claims to be. But I do think that what's happened now is that people are very concerned about that. So I, I read recently, uh, just in the last week, uh, a piece that was some work that was done in Europe about the re-rise of the local store. Um, and uh, how one of the things that will happen is not only because people feel guilty about the local corner store going broke if they don't do it, but also because who do you trust? Um, and so retailers basically are going to have to increase trust values and trust values are going to come from the way in which they're dealing with cleanliness, sanitization, but also from the actual product they're delivering. And so yeah. whether it's retailers or food, food restaurants, et cetera, there's going to be that whole thing of, of much more focus on, is it fresh? Is it, where does it come from? How good is it? Uh, what are you doing? What are you doing with the stuff? I mean, the debate that we had, you know, it was always in the background the last few years about, oh, you know, but actually we don't eat 50% of all the food that gets prepared, right? It gets thrown away. Well, all those sorts of things will sort of get tweaked up a bit more, you know, uh, mm -hmm. by, uh, the interest in, where our food is coming from, where it's going. Yeah. Uh, building on that, I think uh, if it comes to specifically talking about vitamins, minerals, and supplements in grocery and pharmacy, I would say, and both uh, uh, bricks and mortar and e-commerce, one of the uh, mistakes that we've made in the past is to assume that people understand what vitamin C, D, E, L, uh, what the different minerals do and, uh, and uh, uh, why they're good for me. And um, the point of a supplement is to improve my personal nutrition. So how do I, as an individual, understand what I need, what I'm missing, what kind of benefits does this particular product ingredient combination do? Do I have to buy it as a supplement or can I get it from fresh food? So I think that there's an immense piece of work that we need to do as an industry, as retailers, as pharmacists and pharmacy chains, which is about informing and empowering uh, individuals to help them to understand how to personalize 
whether it's through a personal formulation or a combination of different products or uh, a combination of diet and supplements, I think it's so important that we start to, instead of trying to sell a product, that we sell the information and the opportunity for people to understand and believe in what they're doing. That way, we will not only be able to engage them for longer, but we will be able to give them the products and the solutions that will help them to improve their health and wellness outcomes. So, as you said that, Steve, it reminded me of something. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was talking to you about uh, sales on Amazon and other e-commerce sites and the way different categories have grown. One of the fastest growing categories uh, for e-commerce has been fresh fruit in particular. Fresh food, but fresh fruit in particular. But what was interesting, I'd read this report and then the comment was, the, the writer of the report said, but I'm really surprised because blenders had not gone up much. And then the thought was, oh no, the reason why blender sales may not have gone up much was, but lots and lots of people have blenders at home, but don't use them. Hmm. Yeah. And so now there seems to be some evidence that people are blending drinks at home. Now, what's interesting is, again, on a, on a wellness industry uh, conference call I was on uh, not long ago in the last couple of weeks, one of the discussions came back to blended drinks are really hot at the moment. Blended drinks where and people are looking up trying to get information on What's the best blend of different fresh fruits and vegetables to make the best? You know, do I add ginger? What do I do? Right. One of the comments was, how come I've never seen one of the big drug companies give advice on how to make the best blended drinks? No. And to blend in the right supplements that are missing from the ingredients I have. So if I have this, this, and this fruit and vegetables, what am I missing? What should go in that blended drink? And yeah. then that led to the conversation of, you know, you have all these, in every mall in the world, you have these uh, booths, these stores that make blended fruit drinks, right? And somebody actually said, why is it that no uh, health company in the world has a chain of blended drink, a blended mm. drink chain? Yeah, very interesting. Make, yeah, it's sort of like, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Um, in a sense, you know, I know it's logistic and it's all sorts of things, but it yeah. does raise the issue that people are sort of thinking about these things and looking for, well, wait a minute, how do I, how do I know this is the, I want to get a more balanced thing. I want to get extra yeah. health. What's the combinations and what am I missing? Yeah. And what's the goal of, you know, probably some of the companies on this call or, you know, the companies we, you deal with, especially all the time. How can they? Fantastic. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, Dave. Um, Thank pleasure. You. Pleasure sharing and talking with you. I hope uh, uh, the uh, the participants. Uh, I hope there was some uh, some nuggets of insight, uh, information, maybe some ideas that you will uh, um, be able to put into practice. Because ultimately, that's what the academy is designed to do. It's hopefully to inspire you to put into practice and put into real life some uh, real uh, insights and. Uh, uh, what I would ask is, uh, of course, if you think uh, this was interesting and you'd like to hear more of these free webinars, please let us know. And uh, we've got a couple of uh, um, subjects uh, upcoming and we'd like to continue. But of course, um, we're very much uh, open to your feedback. And if you like it, please tell us. If you'd like us to change it in some way, also, please tell us. Uh, but. With that in mind, I will say thank you on behalf of the Consumer Healthcare Training Academy, on behalf of Dave and myself and AIM, who introduced us right at the beginning. And I will um, look forward to seeing you at some point in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.